this video, we're going to summarize the menstrual cycle. We're going to break down the phases of the menstrual cycle. We're going to take a look at the changes in development that occur in the ovaries and uterus, as well as the hormones secreted during the different phases of the cycle. We covered this in great detail in the ovulation and menstruation lecture. So if you haven't seen those lectures, go ahead and watch those first and then come back to this one to review the entire cycle. Let's get started. So females of reproductive age, beginning from puberty until menopause, go through cycles of hormonal changes and activity in the ovaries and uterus every month. Each cycle lasts approximately 28 days, and after that, a new cycle begins. And this is to prepare for a possible pregnancy. The overall cycle is referred to as the menstrual cycle, but it can be divided into the ovarian cycle and the uterine cycle. The ovarian cycle describes the changes in development that occur in the ovary during the menstrual cycle that cause maturation of a follicle, ovulation, and the formation of the corpus luteum. And the uterine cycle describes the changes that happens to the lining of the uterus, the endometrium, during a menstrual cycle to prepare for a potential implantation of a blastocyst. We can divide the events that occur in the ovaries into three phases, the follicular phase, also known as pre-ovulatory, ovulation, and the luteal phase, or post-ovulatory. And the events that happen to the endometrium can also be divided into three phases. The menstrual phase, the proliferative phase, which corresponds with the follicular phase of the ovarian cycle, and the last phase is the secretory phase, which corresponds with the luteal phase of the ovarian cycle. So day one of menstruation, menstrual flow, marks the first day of the menstrual cycle. So day one, this is when bleeding starts. From day one to day 14 is the follicular phase of the ovarian cycle. From day one to day five is the menstrual phase of the uterine cycle. These are events that are occurring at the same time, just at different locations, either an ovarian event or uterine event. And from day 5 to 15 is the proliferative phase. Again, the proliferative phase corresponds to the follicular phase. Then day 14, ovulation occurs. So ovulation separates the follicular phase and luteal phase. From day 15 to day 28 is the luteal phase of the ovarian cycle and the secretory phase of the uterine cycle. Day 15 to day 28 is the luteal phase of the ovarian cycle and the secretory phase of the uterine cycle. So now let's subtract complexity and break down the hyperthalamic pituitary gonadal axis, or HPG axis, because this is what controls this process. Let's zoom in to view the hypothalamus, which is a small region of the brain, and it's close to the pituitary gland. The hypothalamus secretes gonadotropin-releasing hormones, GnRH. The frequency and amplitude of these pulses changes during the cycle. GnRH then travels to the anterior pituitary gland via the hyperthalamic hyperphysial portal vessels and triggers the release of luteinizing hormone, LH, and follicle-stimulating hormone. These hormones then travel to the ovaries and influence several events, which we're going to go through, okay? So we start off with an oogonium or oogonia, which are female primitive germ cells, and these are diploid, to when. This process is occurring during fetal development, pre-puberty, and undergoes proliferation by mitosis and produces primary oocytes. Now, the oocytes that are in the ovaries are in structures known as follicles, and the primary role of follicles is to provide support for the growing oocyte. Let's go through the follicular phase first, which is an ovarian event. Follicles start as primordial follicles. So this right here is a primordial follicle and it has one primary oocyte that's arrested or frozen in prophase one. And it's surrounded by a basal lamina and the single layer of cells. And these cells are called granulosa cells. Now this primordial follicle has the potential to develop into a mature follicle, a graphene follicle or dominant follicle if it's selected to become one, and it has the potential to ovulate or undergo atresia, cell death. 
then from the primordial follicle it's going to turn into a primary follicle and this is stimulated by FSH follicle stimulating hormone it's in the name which is secreted from the anterior pituitary gland the granulosa cells change from a flat shape or squamous shape to a cuboidal shape. The zona pellucida also develops, which separates the oocyte from the granulosa cells, the inner layer of the granulosa cells. But they're still able to communicate through gap, through gap junctions. Then from a primary follicle, it's going to transition to a secondary follicle. The granulosa cells are going to keep multiplying and proliferating and the thicker layer forms and also the antrum, which is a fluid filled space that also develops. Now the thicker cells work together with the granulosa cells to produce estrogen because it lacks, because the granulosa cells lacks the enzymes needed to produce the androgen precursors of estrogen. And so the theca cells come in here to help out the granulosa cells. The theca cells synthesize androgens, androgens from cholesterol, and then androgens diffuse into the granulosa cells and are converted to estrogen. Okay, so then from the secondary follicle, it transitions into a tertiary follicle or a graphene follicle. At this stage, the oocyte is fully grown, it's surrounded by a zona pellucida, then multiple layers of granulosa cells, a basal lamina, and thecal cells. The first meiotic division has already been completed, the oocyte is now a secondary oocyte, and it's a 2N haploid cell. And immediately after the first meiotic division occurs, the secondary, the second meiotic division starts, but it's going to be arrested again, it's going to be frozen again, but this time in metaphase 2, until fertilization occurs. Now, only one egg is ovulated every menstrual cycle, so how is one egg from two ovaries selected to become the dominant follicle and be ovulated? So, at the start of each cycle, 10 to 25 of these preantral follicles, or preantral, just the developing antrum, develop into larger antral follicles. So antral, the antrum, the fluid-filled space. So primary follicles to secondary follicles. Follicular growth is stimulated by FSH and LH. Now let's bring in the graph just to show the follicular phase and ovulation and show the concentration of these hormones. Okay, so at the start of the cycle, FSH and LH concentration increase, stimulating follicular growth. Then around day seven, only one of these follicles will continue to develop into the dominant or the graphene follicle, it becomes the chosen one. And, it's and so it's going to transition into a mature follicle. This is the graphene follicle. And the other follicles that weren't the chosen one in birth ovaries, are called the non-dominant follicles. And these follicles are going to degrade and die, which is a process called atresia. Sorry, but you guys weren't the chosen one. So day one to day seven, multi multiple follicles develop. And around day seven, one follicle usually becomes a dominant follicle. And it will develop into a graphene follicle. And it's going to secrete large amounts of estrogen secreted by the granulosa cells because the granulosa cells secrete estrogen with the help of theca cells. And so when it transitions into a mature graphene follicle, it's going to start secreting large amounts of estrogen. And that is the end of the follicular phase, days 1 to 14. So let's move on to ovulation. Around day 14, ovulation occurs. The granulosa cells synthesize enzymes and prostaglandins that break down the membranes, the follicular ovarian membranes, and so it ruptures and the oocyte is released, the secondary oocyte. Ovulation is triggered by a mid-cycle surge of luteinizing hormone, known as the LH surge, and this is occurring around days 12 to 13. This is caused by high levels of estrogen, exerting a positive feedback on the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary gland. So the anterior pituitary gland is going to secrete more LH and FSH, leading to an LH surge triggering ovulation. And during this surge, there's also going to be an increase in FSH and progesterone levels, and estrogen decreases just before ovulation. Now, following ovulation is the next ovarian phase, known as the luteal phase. This is days 15 to 28 
of the cycle. After the graphene follicle releases the secondary oocyte and the anitral fluid, the walls of the follicle collapses and it's going to be transformed into the corpus luteum. So from days 15 to 25, the corpus luteum develops and matures. The corpus luteum secretes large amounts of progesterone and estrogen and as well as the protein hormone inhibin. So progesterone levels are high during the luteal phase. And that's because progesterone plays an important role in making sure the endometrium is ready for implantation of a blastocyst. Now, the increase in progesterone and estrogen inhibits FSH and LH release. So no new follicles develop, and this is also to prevent another LH surge. And when the egg is not fertilized, the corpus luteum degenerates, and this is days 25 to 28, marking the end of the luteal phase, and a new cycle begins. Okay, so this is what's occurring in the ovaries during the menstrual cycle. Let's now talk about the changes that occur to the endometrium during the menstrual cycle. So if we recall back to the uterine cycle lecture, the endometrium is the inner membrane lining of the uterus. And during the menstrual cycle, the endometrium grows to a thick lining filled with blood vessels to prepare for a possible implantation, a possible pregnancy, a possible gas that may or may not come. It can be subdivided into two parts. There is the deep stratum basalis, the basal layer, and the stratum functionalis. This is the functional and also superficial layer. This is the part of the endometrium that sheds off during menstruation. At the start of the video, I mentioned the uterine cycle can be divided into three phases. The menstrual phase, proliferative phase, and secretory phase. So let's start with the menstrual phase. This is day one to five after the luteal phase. During menstruation, the epithelial lining of the uterus degenerates, and this is the source of the menstrual flow. The stratum functionalis, the functional layer, superficial layer, is the part of the endometrium that is lost. It's disintegrated. Now, the changes that occur to the uterine lining are caused by the changes in estrogen and progesterone concentrations. So during the luteal phase, the corpus luteum was formed and it secretes large amounts of progesterone and estrogen. And when the egg is not fertilized, the corpus luteum loses its functions. And so the concentration of progesterone and estrogen significantly drops. And when it drops, the endometrium is deprived of hormonal support. And so it's going to start releasing prostaglandins. And this leads to the spiral arteries that supply the stratum functional the stratum functionalis, so recall the stratum functionalis are supplied with spiral and coiled arteries, whereas the basal layer are supplied with straight and short arteries. And also the uterine smooth muscle layer starts contracting because of the prostaglandins. This is mediated by the prostaglandins. The uterine blood vessels constricts, so there's a reduced blood flow and also reduced nutrients to the cell. And this leads to necrosis of the endometrium. And so the functional layer and capillary walls rupture and damaged capillaries and endometrial debris are the source of menstrual flow. So the functional layer is the only layer that is lost. The basal layer, the other layer of the endometrium, remains unaffected. And that's because it's supplied with short and straight arteries. So that's the menstrual phase, day one to day five. After menstruation, it's the proliferative phase from day 5 to day 15. The body begins to prepare to release an egg again. And so the hypothalamus secretes GnRH, triggering the release of FSH and LH from the anterior pituitary gland, and this stimulates follicular growth. So new follicles begin to develop again. And remember that the proliferative phase corresponds with the follicular phase. And so as the follicles grow, it starts secreting estrogen, and estrogen stimulates endometrium growth and vascularization. The cells of the basal layer starts proliferating and multiplying to, gener to regenerate the functional layer again, as well as the spiral and coiled arteries. So the endometrium grows thicker to prepare for a potential implantation again. It's so optimistic. Then on day 14, ovulation occurs, a new egg is, re is ovulated, a secondary oocyte is released, and it's the start of the secretory phase, which corresponds with the luteal phase, day 15 to day 28. 
During this phase, the corpus luteum develops and secretes large amounts of progesterone, and progesterone transforms the endometrium to an actively secreting tissue. The endometrial is rich with blood vessels, and the glands become coiled and spiral, a corkscrew shape, and it's filled with glycogen and enzymes. During this phase, progesterone also thickens the mucus that's secreted by the cervix. It's usually clear and watery, but when the concentration of progesterone is high, it creates a mucus plug to prevent bacteria from entering the uterus, and this is also to protect the growing embryo during gestation if fertilization has occurred. Now, if implantation and fertilization doesn't occur, the corpus luteum degenerates. Progesterone and estrogen levels drop, the functional layer and the artery supporting the functional layer ruptures, and the epithelial layer is lost. The functional layer is lost. And this is the source of menstrual flow. And when progesterone and estrogen levels drop, FSH and LH secretions begin to increase again, triggering the start of a new cycle. And so new follicles will begin to develop and the cycle starts again. The start of the cycle is day one of menstruation, when bleeding starts. So that is the menstrual cycle. In the previous lectures, we covered this in great detail in the ovulation ovarian cycle lecture and also the uterine cycle lecture. So if you'd like a refresher, go ahead and check those lectures out and I'll see you there. Thank you for watching this video. Make sure you subscribe to EKG Science so you don't miss a single lecture. And remember, subtract complexity and slow down. To study the next lecture, simply click the next video or you can view the entire playlist. Hey, stop procrastinating!